This is Honors Biology Chapter 4, and we are focused on cell membranes, and this is going to be Part 1. Um, let me get myself in presentation mode. Oh, I'm in the middle. Okay, so the first thing on this introductory slide, do you see this little sketch I just kind of whipped up here? I want to make sure that you know, I want you to be able to do a simple little sketch of a cell membrane when we're done and be able to identify all the parts that you see in this picture right here and tell me what each of them can do, okay? Hashtag goals. All right, so on this uh, presentation, um, we're gonna focus on the structures of the membrane and then what those structures do, what their functions are, okay? Um, so um, down below in the descriptor, I have notes available for you to use. Um, and in my students, they fill in column one, and they um, and I tell them what to put in there using the notes. And then column two is for pictures or images that could help you. All right, here we go. So taking a look at the cell membrane, and at this point in your education, you should know about the four important organic molecules, right? What are the four important organic molecules? Are you saying carbohydrates? Yeah, and you're saying lipids, and there's two categories of lipids under that umbrella, fats and steroids, right? And you're saying, proteins and you're saying nucleic acids, right? So can you find the four important organic molecules in a cell membrane? I'll give you just a second and that's all I'm giving you. Take a look right here. These big orange things that are labeled proteins, those are in fact proteins. So that's one. These that look like a circle with little legs dangling down, dangling down, those are phospholipids, and that's a modification of a fat. Remember, fat is a glycerol molecule with three fatty acid chains. So this is a modification of a fat. So we have lipids. Now, what was the other lipid, right? Steroids. You can see steroids too. See the four rings right here? So these are steroids, all right? So we have got proteins, We've got phospholipids and steroids, which are types of lipids. Number three, do we have any carbohydrate side chains? Yes, we do. They are right here. Do you see those little discs? Each one of those little discs would be like a monosaccharide, right? And so now this is a whole chain of sugars hooked together. Um, and that's part of what's called the glycocalyx. We've already talked about bacterial cell walls. And remember how we looked at the carbohydrates on the outside? So there are two kinds. There are glycoproteins, which are attached to proteins like this one. Um, and there are glycolipids, which are attached to lipids like this one. Now, the glyco part is your clue that it's a carbohydrate. When it says lipid and protein, that's just what the carbohydrate is anchored to. Is it anchored to a lipid or is it anchored to a protein? All right, so taking a look, when you look at this diagram right here and you can see um, the phospholipids, right? So you can see the circles and then hanging down. I want you to remember, right, that the part, these right here, the fatty acid chains, remember what they are? They are hydro phobic, right? And then the phosphate groups right here are hydrophilic. So they are water loving. And this should make sense to us in the setup of the membrane because the phobic part are hanging out in the middle of the membrane. They're scared. And then these parts are either facing um, the water that the cell is sitting in or the interior cytosol or cytoplasm inside. So you can see this is labeled hydrophobic tail, hydrophilic heads. All right, you can see also the carbohydrate side chains are only on the outside, right? Um, I want you to look at these proteins. Some are going all the way across, some are partial right here on the side, and we're gonna discuss each of those two, but let's go dive into your notes. Under membrane components, okay, under membrane components, you have um, that it is a, oh, amphipathic molecule, forgot to mention that again. Amphipathic means that there's two different regions, right? There's a region that's hydrophilic, and on that same region, there's a part that's hydrophobic, and we learned that before, right? So amphipathic molecules, the heads are hydrophilic, right? And they are pointed either, they're pointed out, but either out to the, um, the solution that the cell is sitting in or they're pointed into the aqueous medium inside the cell. Okay, the tails, tails are hydrophobic and they're to the interior, to the interior or pointed in. All right, and then additionally what we can see, and let me go back, let me go back one picture, right? The cholesterol, you can see the cholesterol molecules in here, the purple, okay? And let me tell you what those do. 
the cholesterol molecules um, help kind of fill in the spaces of the fatty acid chains that are hanging down in there. And they prevent, if it gets really cold, it would prevent the phospholipid layer from freezing, okay, by creating space in there. But also if it gets really hot and the molecules are moving a little bit faster, it kind of keeps the integrity of the cell membrane so it doesn't fall apart. So for cholesterol, and this is, by the way, in only animal cells, and cholesterol helps modify the fluidity of the membrane over a range of temperatures. If it's too hot, it prevents it from becoming too fluid, prevents it from becoming too fluid. If it's too cold, it prevents it from freezing. All right, so let me keep going. All right, so then you can see these proteins. And let's go in another view here. So this is a transmembrane protein. It's going all the way across. Here we can see the hydrophobic region of the fatty acids and the hydrophilic region. And what I want you to think about for a quick minute is remember, what are proteins built out of? Do you remember? Amino acids, right? And we remember that how many different amino acids are there? 20, right? And remember, what, what's the variable part of the amino acids? That's the R group, right? So there's 20 different amino acids because there's 20 different R groups. Some of those R groups are hydrophilic, some are hydrophobic, right? Ones that are philic would be like polar R groups or charged um, R groups. Hydrophobic are nonpolar, like several carbons all together with some hydrogens around it, remember? So when you look at this protein right here, what does that say about the amino acids of the protein right here? It must be what? Hydrophobic because the fatty acid chains are hydrophobic. And the part that is facing either the watery exterior or interior, those must be hydrophilic, right? Now, what's right inside here? What do you think these are? Remember what supports the cell membrane is the cytoskeleton. So you can see parts of the cytoskeleton right here. So another picture, let me get you another one. Okay, so this is a peripheral protein because it's just on the outside, um, um, or sorry, not is outside the cell would be here. I can tell that because here is a glycolipid right here. This is just on the interior, or if it's just on the outside for some reason, that would be peripheral. It means it's on the edge, like peripheral vision, right? And then integral uh, membrane proteins could cross all the way across, or they're embedded somewhat in that phospholipid bilayer. So on your proteins, integral are completely embedded. Um, or spans the cell membrane. So they're embedded or span the cell membrane. And then peripheral is just on one side of the membrane, just on one side of the membrane. Okay, now notice how I could tell whether it was inside the cell or outside the cell. One, one thing I used was this. I know that's a glycolipid because it's attached to a lipid. Also the interior is where the cytoskeleton would be. And I can see that right here. Okay, now, Looking outside, it's a little more complicated than what I've shown you previously, okay? There is, get your bearings real quick. Here's your phospholipid bilayer, right? Here you can see parts of the cytoskeleton, which look like chopsticks or something. It's like not very, okay, anyway, but that's a cytoskeleton or pickup stick. So here's your phospholipid bilayer. Then outside, look at all this stuff, right? You have you have collagen right here. You have carbohydrate side chains in here. So that's what's referred to as the ECM, the extracellular matrix. It's attached to the cell and it's to the outer surface, whereas this would be the intracellular matrix within. So on your extracellular matrix on your notes, um, and this is animal cells only, why would that be? Hmm. What is right outside the cell membrane on plant cells? Do you remember? Cell walls. Exactly. All right. So um, sometimes the ECM is referred to as a coat instead of a rigid wall of cellulose. It's like a coat of carbohydrates. All right. So um, it contains protein fibers and the glycocalyx. The glycocalyx is a combination of our glycolipids and our glycoproteins. And I, I'm going to hit that again in just a little bit. If you scan down in the notes, you can see that. Okay, so it's the glycocalyx, similar to what we saw in bacterial cells. Okay, and the function is support and communication. Support and communication. And it may anchor some proteins. And it may anchor some proteins. So our conclusion our conclusion on our cells, 
okay, is that they are asymmetrical, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, it's not the same on both sides. Like we're symmetrical, right? Eyes, eyes, nostrils, right? We're symmetrical, the ears right here. But the, the cell membrane is asymmetrical. To the outside, you have the ECM, extracellular matrix, all these carbohydrates or maybe proteins or collagen or whatever you have out here. And then to the interior, you have your cytoskeleton. So the membrane is asymmetrical to the inside cytoskeleton, which can anchor some proteins. And then to the outside, you have your ECM, the extracellular matrix. Okay. Also, what does the cell membrane do? We've talked about this before, right? What does the cell membrane do? It is responsible for dynamic, what? Homeostasis, right? Dynamic homeostasis between the cell's external and internal environment, between the cell's external and internal environment. Now, remember, we said cells are small because you need a large, what? Surface area per volume. The smaller the cell, the greater the surface area per volume because that's where all exchange takes place, all right? And we're gonna talk about how to get across this membrane, but we're gonna identify a few more structures first, okay? So the cell membrane, the model for the cell membrane is referred to as the fluid mosaic model. Now this may strike you as odd, but the cell membrane has like the fluidity, the consistency of olive oil right? That's crazy, right? Olive oil. And it's just this hydrophobic interaction, right? And the hydrophilic interactions that kind of keep its continuity. Um, so the mosaic part of our fluid mosaic model are all of these scattered proteins in and amongst it. So on your notes, fluid mosaic model, the fluid is the phospholipid bilayer, and it's the consistency of olive oil. And the mosaic is the scattered proteins, the scattered proteins. Okay, and then your glycolipins and your glycoproteins, which you can see, here's a glycoprotein, carbohydrates on a protein. Here's a glycolipid, it's attached right to the lipid. Okay, so um, you wanna have carbohydrate side chains, side chains attached to either a protein or a lipid. And these are unique to every cell. This tells you, A, what kind of cell it is in your body, and whose body it belongs to, right? So this identifies each cell is unique to you. So um, unique to each cell, it is their fingerprint. It is their fingerprint. What are the functions of the glycolipids and the glycoproteins? Well, one is cell-to-cell -cell adhesion as well as recognition. Adhesion, like for part of the connection, right? And then we'll talk about other things that help with that too. And then recognition. Remember, cells are blind. The only way you can talk to a cell is if you touch the cell directly, right? Um, and you can have receptors for chemicals. Those are the two ways you can talk to cells. So it's how you know one cell from another, cell to cell adhesion and recognition, and then reception B of signaling molecules, reception of signaling molecules. All right. So now we know what all the players are. Let's go see what they do. Okay, in more detail and specifically protein functions, protein functions. So take a look at this. You can tell the outside from the inside, right? So we know the phospholipid bilayer serves as a barrier, right? So we know that function, right? We know about the glycolipids and the glycoproteins in adhesion and recognition, right? So we've talked about that. We already know the function of cholesterol, right? It has to do with fluidity of the membrane. So a membrane doesn't freeze if it's too cold or fall apart if it's too hot. So now we're just gonna focus on the functions of the proteins, okay? The functions of the proteins. So the first one we're gonna look at, okay, is we're gonna look at a channel protein. The way I remember this, I go like this, channels. Okay, I'm gonna teach you a little song to remember this. So channel proteins, like all proteins, are hyper specific. They only allow a one thing to go um, through that. It's like you can see this door a little bit behind me. It's like if only one person in this house could move through that door, one person and one person only, and only in one direction. Okay, that's what channel proteins do. They're very, very specific. Now, on your notes, um, I want you to write allows a particular molecule to cross freely, to cross freely. Okay, it just goes right through that channel, but it's very specific. All the proteins are. 
Okay, an example of where this doesn't work, if you've heard of cystic fibrosis before, this is an inherited disorder. And this is because just one type of channel, it, it's amongst you know many of your cells, but this one channel is, is not working. And what it doesn't allow to pass freely is chloride ions. And if your chloride ions cannot pass freely through those particular protein channels, then you will have cystic fibrosis. Now, I wanna back it up a little bit. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease, right? So that means you inherited a gene that coded for a bad protein, okay? Because remember, the way you enact your DNA is through your proteins. And so this is, you have a bad gene, which makes a bad protein, and now chloride cannot pass through. So for cystic fibrosis, what happens is oftentimes, like in old days, they would just have to have their parents or family member or what a friend, whatever, pound their back to loosen up the mucus um, so they could spit it out. Now there are percussion vests. So this, this little girl is wearing this percussion vest and it's literally beating on her back to cause enough vibration to loosen the mucus in her lungs so she can breathe, okay? She needs assistance with her breath by having higher concentrations of oxygen. But it doesn't just affect her lungs, okay? Look at all the things it affects. It affects her liver, right? Her pancreas, her intestines, her reproductive organs. It would be like having like pneumonia in every vessel that you've got going in your body, okay? And you could see why that would be bad. It just fills up with those, um, those they cannot function, they cannot transport, and they get clogged. Right, so I think you have everything for that cystic fibrosis, faulty chloride ion channels. All right, so channels. Our next one carriers. You ready? So, carriers, it's just like what you did sounds right. A door, somebody can just walk through it. If somebody's going to carry you, they have to come in contact with you. Now, I want to tell you a little something about carriers first of all. Okay, so carriers can be involved in both passive transport of substances and active transport. Active transport, in a nutshell, requires some sort of energy or ATP in order to move that substance. You're moving it against the gradient. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but I want you to know that carriers can be used passively going with the gradient, like just keeping the flow, carrying you across from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, or actively from a lower concentration to a higher concentration if you're trying to concentrate something to one side of the membrane. When they do that, they are called pumps, okay? They are called pumps if it costs you energy. All right, let me get small again. Now, um, on your notes, carrier proteins selectively interact with a, with a specific molecule so it can cross the membrane. Now, um, one very famous pump where it's energy, it costs energy, is the sodium potassium pump. Okay. And the sodium potassium pump, what it does, and this is how all your nerves and muscles work. Okay. Is via sodium potassium pump. Take a look here at picture one. Okay. So there's a spot here for three sodium ions to bind as well as a spot for ATP to bind in this protein pump that is in the cell membrane. All right. And when you spin that ATP, when that phosphate attaches on, okay, what happens is it then switches position, the protein changes its shape, okay, as a result of that, and so it opens up on the other side. And what happens is then those three sodium ions will be on that side of the membrane, but it costs you energy to do that right? It now creates a vacancy for two potassium ions to bind. And then you can see they are then released to the interior. So three sodiums out, two potassiums in, three sodiums out, two potassiums in. Okay. This is how your nerves work. This is how your muscles work is creating this difference, this concentration gradient difference, more sodiums out than in. There's more to that story, put a pin in it. But for right now, you need to know this is an example of a carrier. And the issue is that it's it's hypothesized that some people have trouble with their sodium potassium pumps, that this is why they are more prone to obesity, more prone to obesity is their sodium potassium pumps are not working well. Of course, it is also a factor of the calories that they are consuming and the type of calories they're consuming. But additionally, they could have issues with their sodium potassium pumps. All right, so we have two functions down, channels, carriers. Do that with me so you remember all the functions, channels and carriers. 
All right, let's get to our next function. Okay, our next function is cell recognition. Remember, cells are, are blind, so that's why I go like this, cell recognition. And in cell recognition, okay, look at this right here. We got a glycoprotein. That can help with cell recognition. Glycolipids can help in cell recognition as well. Now, glycoproteins in particular are something that is involved in your immune system where you know self from non-self, right? Because if something gets in your body, that's not Winnie Sloan, then my body is going to want to attack it. And it knows that because these are not Winnie Sloan's. Okay. These have a different name on them. And where you can see issues with that is in organ transplants. Okay. Here I'll move so you can see better. So in organ transplants, because what happens is, let's say you really need a kidney. Okay. And you get that kidney, but that kidney doesn't have your doesn't have your extracellular matrix. It doesn't have the glycolipids and glycoproteins of you. And so what happens is you will attack that kidney um, as if it were bacteria that was invading your body. So oftentimes people who get an organ transplant have to take immunosuppressant drugs so they won't attack that organ, so they won't reject it, okay? So on your notes for um, cell recognition, okay, um, glycoproteins are part of the MHC which stands for major histocompatibility complex. We'll learn about those in your immune system later. And it's how a cell recognizes, how a cell recognizes self from non-self. Problems with that with organ donors, organ donors. All right, let's look at another one. Okay, so we have channels, carriers, cell recognition. Then you just take this hand and bring it right up here and go like this and go receptors, okay? So some proteins act as receptors. They have a very special shape and then molecules can fit in them. Like um, for cell signaling, it could be a hormone to trigger, let's say, growth, okay? And if your protein is not in the right shape, okay, and why wouldn't it be in the right shape? Because you had bad DNA, right? You had mutated DNA that coded for a misformed protein and then it can't do its job. And so they think that this could be part of the problem, this receptor protein, in what you see in one of the types of dwarfisms. These are all adult females, right? But their arms and their legs are a little bit shorter, not because they don't have growth hormone, but because their receptors that would then tell their cell to divide and grow is not working. So underneath receptor proteins shaped so that a specific molecule like a hormone can bind to it. Some forms of dwarfism are associated with this. All right, next one, you ready? Okay, enzymatic. So channels, carriers, cell recognition, receptors, and then you shake your hands right here, do a little dance move, enzymatic, okay? Enzymatic proteins, these proteins are, act like enzymes and they catalyze reactions. And if again, they are not formed right, that can be a problem. But in this case, we have a bacterium that's interfering with the proper functioning of this enzymatic protein and specifically the functioning of what's called adenylate cyclase. And this leads to, when I say severe diarrhea, it's hidium, okay? This is cholera. Cholera, you lose so much fluid out your digestive tract, you become so dehydrated, that is what you die of. And the problem is it's so contagious. So when people go to care for somebody who has cholera, they can easily get cholera themselves, and then it just passes, passes, passes. Kind of like COVID, but COVID is a virus. This is a bacterium. So enzymatic proteins carry out specific metabolic functions like adenylate cyclase and enzymatic proteins that metabolizes ATP. Cholera is a bacterial disease that releases a toxin that interferes with this process. Okay, channels, carriers, cell recognition, receptors, enzymatic, now junctions, okay? Junctions is gonna be our last one. So here, these proteins from two different cells are adhered together to hold that cell together. So think about it, like if you grab your skin right here, I'm, you know, I am not ripping off my skin right here on my hand because of the cellular junctions that I have. And there are different types. We're not gonna go in, whoa, whoa, I stopped in the middle, stay right there. Okay, so we're not gonna go into all of them right now, but here you can see there are tight junctions stitched together, like so your bladder doesn't leak into your 
gastrointestinal, you know, cavity, um, or abdominal cavity, sorry, you have desmosomes, like, like these could be part of your cytoskeleton can be connected. You have gap junctions where one channel in one cell lines up with another channel in another cell. And as a result, fluids can pass between them. Okay. So underneath junction proteins join cells so that they can work together as a tissue performing a function together, performing a function together. All right. Good job. Okay. Now we're going to make a slight transition. Okay. So what we've talked about so far is the structure of a membrane. Okay. And everybody's functions, including proteins. So now we're just going to take a little bit of a peek into how things can cross the membrane. All right. And then that'll be more detailed um, in video two. All right. So look right here. Okay. So I'm going to teach you something. Okay. So there are basically, actually, actually, before I do this, okay, let me teach it to you this way. There are three ways and only three ways to cross a membrane. You got that? Three ways to cross a membrane. You can go through the phospholipid bilayer, okay? Right through the phospholipid bilayer, but not if you are large or charged, okay? We'll talk about that in a minute, okay? So through the phospholipid bilayer, but not if you are large or charged. Way number two, you can use a channel or a carrier. That makes sense, right? A channel or a carrier. And then way number three is bulk transport, where you use the whole membrane, where you're going and engulfing like endocytosis, and later we'll learn about three different types of endocytosis, or exocytosis, where you're expelling something, okay? So what are the three ways to cross a membrane? Through the phospholipid bilayer, but not if you're large or charged, using a channel or a carrier or whole membrane, endo, exocytosis of bulk transport. Okay, sweet, good. Now, let me make myself smaller again. All right, so look right here. Here's your phospholipid bilayer, and things are trying to get across. Remember I told you, not if you're large or charged. So these guys are charged, it's not happening. It's no, they can't get in, and these cannot get out through a phospholipid bilayer, but they could use what? Channel carrier, yeah, okay. Now, water, water's not charged, but remember what we know about water. It's a polar molecule. Remember how oxygen is partially negative and the hydrogens are partially positive? So. But because it's so small, it can pass through, but it's going to get some assistant, assistance. And the assistance it gets is actually through um, an aquaporin. And I'm going to show you that in just a quick minute. All right. Now look at these non-charged molecules like fats. Fats can go through fats because this is a phospholipid. This molecule is large, not happening. You can't get through the phospholipid bilayer. All right. So this is telling you, if you are small, if you are um, not charged, okay, you can go right through the phospholipid bilayer. If you are nonpolar and a little bit bigger, you can also get in because fats dissolve into fats. So in general, okay, what can freely, so permeability of the plasma membrane, only certain molecules can pass through. Only certain molecules can pass through. In general, what can pass freely through a phospholipid bilayer? Water, okay, gases like oxygen, carbon dioxide, right? That's important. And small, non charged, usually non polar molecules, okay? So water and gases are going to go right through. Water and gases are going to go right through either direction, right? Small polar or smaller non polar molecules can go right through. Okay, what cannot pass, you shall not pass, okay, without a little help from somebody is large or charged molecules, large or charged. All right, next one. Okay, so take a look at this. This is a great one, okay? This is telling you the difference between passive and active. We already learned this, right? Active transport is going to require ATP. You're going to go against the gradient. It means you're trying to concentrate something to one side of the cell. Okay, so for instance, look at these orange diamonds. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five on the inside. Okay, we have two diamonds on the outside. So if we were going with the concentration gradient high to low, you would think they'd go from the bottom of the screen to the top. 
But no, they're coming in, but that's gonna cost you some money. It's gonna cost you some ATP to get those to come inside. So you can see that's active. Okay, passive transport, no energy necessary, okay? There's two ways, through the phospholipid bilayer or a channel or a carrier, as long as you're going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, okay? So look at these. All of these have more on the outside than they do on the inside, okay? So they wanna go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. These guys are going right through the phospholipid bilayer, so they must not have a charge and they must not be too large. These, however, need some help with their diffusion. That's why it's called facilitated diffusion. The channels or the carriers are facilitating that molecule going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So on your notes, for um, passive transport, it does not require energy, okay? Does not require energy. And then jump down to active transport, it requires energy and it goes against the concentration gradient and it goes against the concentration gradient. Okay, so now the last thing there is aquaporins. So remember how I told you water is a polar molecule. And so it goes through, but it goes through I mean, like when you measure how fast it can get through the phospholipid bilayer, it goes through pretty quickly. And the reason it gets an assist, okay? And what it, get, it gets an assist from is a protein channel dedicated just for water, aquaporin, aquaporin. So aquaporins are channel proteins for water molecules, channel proteins for water molecules. And my friends, Part two, we will talk about next time, um, more details on passive and active transport, give you all the deets on that. And um, yeah, that's it.